Perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, um, Dashboards in R Using Flex Dashboard, uh, run by Richard Wilson. So thank you for joining us, and we hope you find it really useful. Please feel free to um, ask any questions using the chat box or Q&A function, and we'll be able to um, answer them throughout or to address them at the end. Uh, over to you, Richard. Right. Afternoon, everyone. Um, so welcome to this webinar. There's quite a lot to get through in an hour, so I shall crack on. Um, I won't bother with all the introductions, but um, most of the time I'm a consultant, previously worked in the NHS, but I'm actually now just supporting the vaccination programme as well. So there's my contact details. I'm sure the slides will get circulated post the session via the website and things. So let's make sure. Uh, yeah, so the aim of the talk really is not going to be about the shimmy, which although is the content we're going to use, we're not going to be able to talk about shimmy, which I'll spend most of my time, but I'm going to be looking at what R has to offer in the dashboard area and focusing on how it reflects the sort of design principles and building a dashboard. There is too much R to go through in an hour in the scripts, so I'm going to put some blogs up on the community website about the charts, and etc. So if you have areas you think you want me to look at, please um, get in touch via either the chat or I'm sure we can do it through Twitter or the Slack. Um, and I will stick the updated code on GitHub at, stage, uh, at some stage in the future. But the focus is very much going to be what I've learned and to help avoid you having the same issues as I go along through this, uh, through building the task dashboard. Um, <clears throat> also, what I would like you to be is my bug squad today. So there's lots of issues about sizing and bugs in the tool. So I put a copy up on our pubs. So if you take down this <coughs> um, URL, so https slash slash rpubs.com slash Richard I7, then it's shimmy, so S H M I 0217. If you do that and open it up, that should take you through to the web, the dashboard. I should have put it out on every page, but I'll leave it up there for a bit longer. If you open it up, then you can follow along and you can see how the dashboard works. But also, if you see a bug, stick it, stick it in chat because there will be some. Um, there's some interesting ones about how the dashboard renders on different screens, especially the old trust tab, as you'll see later, potentially, if I can remember how to share my screen properly. So have a go at opening that up, and hopefully everyone's got had enough time to take down the bit which is most important, which is Richard I7 slash shimmy um, 0217. Um, my journey to using R has quite, quite, been quite long, really, because I've really been, it's not a nonlinear path, and I think this reflects the sort of Thomas Mock's um, stuff on the uh, use of R markdown, which I'm going to sort of refer to later because it influenced quite a lot of the work, is it's been quite a varied approach. So I've done, I started with ZX80, which had 16Ks of expansion, which currently wouldn't run any of my charts. So it's quite shocking, really, to see how we've moved forward. But I've done a HTML, the server web server in 1994. Um, I've done my own SQL server. But when I moved into NHS, of course, I picked up Excel in a big way and a bit of Tableau. But I've only been doing R for a year, really. But why is this important? Because it, it will influence how, much, how I code. So if you look at my code, it will tend to be more verbose, lots of small steps, lots of tables because of the SQL background and lots of calculated fields. So there possibly is a lot of redundancy in how I code, because it just reflects that way of approaching, which is much more narrative and verbose than jumping around with some vectors and things. So it's probably quite narrative in terms of coding style. So why mortality? Well, it's something which I've been working on for the last 10 years, supporting through my role at NHSI as National Director of Quality and Intelligence. Um, it's meant to give you um, an insight into mortality at acute trusts, as I say, it's not going to be a whole talk on Shimmy because there's loads more you can learn about it elsewhere. But it's important that trusts look at it as part of the quality accounts. Um, and every trust will have excess deaths in some areas, somewhere where they'll, be ha they'll have a high levels of deaths. Um, and it's an area where trusts spend a lot of money. So they'll buy in services from Dr. Foster's, DFI or HED, which is a healthcare evaluation data tool, or, or myself, I7. <clears throat> And they could pretty much do everything themselves, as most of the shimmy data is freely available for NHS Digital. So most trusts are either doing too much, too much analysis, or too little and missing the point. Uh, there's actually an interesting data size quote for this, because this is the largest, long, longest running algorithm 
using the risk question in the NHS and possibly globally. So if you want to know about machine learning, um, at least this is done in logistic regression, repeated every month, so it's pretty much a data science project. For today, for the RAG rating, all you know, need to know is if Shim is greater than one, it's higher than England. If it's lower than one, it's lower than England. And that's the sort of only thing you need to know about Shimmy for today to get any information out of the dashboard. So before I set off building the dashboard in R, there's a part of it which actually is understanding how you design the dashboard. And there's a sort of six step plan to creating a dashboard. Determining purpose and audience, planning the dashboard using best design principles, building it, testing it, deploying it, maintaining and iterate and iterating it. Um, really, this talk is going to focus probably on one, two, three. Uh, the testing, deploying and maintenance is a few slides at the end there, but the, you'll find out iteration, iteration, iteration is going to be quite a challenge in terms of using R because of constant. Oh, there's a new package. Oh, there's a new package. Have you done it this way? I've done it that way, which is really great. But when you're trying to create a stable product, it does become rather um, all consuming. So in terms of purpose and audience, and this is the most important thing about doing any dashboard or any piece of work, is what is the purpose of a dashboard? So this dashboard is a high level view of the available data, focusing on other key measures related to shimmy. There's not a lot of interactivity because it's an explanatory, not an exploratory dashboard, because the user is a mortality lead, a board member, medical director or deputy, have some understanding of the measures, wants a quick summary, see what's changed, and who need a guided explanation through the data. This is not for the likes of ourselves, analysts or clinicians, who want to explore this, why their service is different and really drill down to the patients and things like that, which you can do in bigger, more powerful warehouse database tools. Um, I have a dashboard which does do that, but it's not the one I'm using here because it has sensitive information and I can't use it outside of a trust. This one's all public data, so we can look at it. Oh, no, sorry, I'm going to have to go back one. I've just gone a little too fast. So the best practice for executive dashboards really is, and I borrowed this from um, VizZen data, which if you're into healthcare visualizations, is quite an interesting website of um, visualizations and tactics and processes. But it's a sort of seven principles. So to try and consolidate it, cons consolidate it onto one dashboard, so a picture on a page. Um, you can test me whether or not I've achieved any of these later. Keep it high level, so only one trust per dashboard. So there's not a lot of filtering, they just want to see the trust. Um, the focus on the f shaped layout and grids, and I'll describe that in the next slide. Interactivity should be minimal. The, you should be able to find the information by looking, not by digging into it. It should be presented to them. But interactivity can be useful to help uh, explain the data in a more interactive way so they can get themselves and look at numbers and you'll see how that works later. Um, use colour to draw attention to specific measures, you know, rag rate, um, the dreaded rag rate. Consider simple charts for fast analysis and this is where you can test me later on whether or not some of my charts aren't necessarily that simple but I liked it. Um, but also the idea of bringing in short explanations and directions about how to use a dashboard and what it means so that you can't go off message. The one which affects how we do this in R is really number three, the F-shaped layout and grids. So um, a bit of visual psychology for everybody. Um, for those of us in a Western culture using English or Latin based or Greek based languages, we tend to read left to right. Um, obviously, there are languages like Japanese or Arabic which go right to left, um, but predominantly we all read left to right. So that means that any information we put in the bottom right hand corner, no one's going to look at. So if you want to bury any bad news, bottom right hand corner it. But if we want to empower the readers, we need to put the most important information in the top left hand corner. So up here in the emphasised section up in the left hand side. So when we build tools, we do it naturally anyway, but it's worth bearing in mind that the top left hand side is where you should put the most important thing, the navigation, the key numbers. Um, but also use a grid, as in this table, and this looks like in this grid on the right hand side, to group information together so that you can, so users know what charts go together. And this is why I've used tab set later on, is because it means I can put things together in sections. So, in terms of design, those are the design principles we're going to keep there in mind. In terms of planning the dashboard, the content is really rather easy for me because digital produces set of data files every month 
and they've got a series of indicators in there which um, are used and I've thrown a few more, a few more in which I like, but they're not necessarily the ones that Genesis Digital would use. So in terms of content, it's all predefined. I don't have to worry about that. Um, I have thrown some things out but they're not relevant, but I've tried to capture most of the published data. In terms of orientation and size, so we've already talked about the F shape, but now it's a question of how big do we do it vertically, horizontally, and what the medium is we're going to look at it. These are more numbers for, you know, it's the first set of numbers here, so I'm always we're all looking at the chart on the right hand side trying to work out, oh, wait a minute, what's going up, what's going down? So this was the screen size survey from May 2020. Now, considering we've all been working at home for a year, we imagine the screen size is at 1920 by 1082 has probably gone up quite considerably because we'll all be probably working at home screens rather of laptops down at the bottom around 1400, 1400 by 900. But it does make a difference when you're building dashboards because if you set pixel size, you need to know what size you can go to because obviously I'm working on a 4K screen, so I'm doing like 2000 by 1000 or something ridiculous, um, which means everything looks fantastically big and brilliant. When I put it onto my um, my laptop next door to me, it all goes hideously wrong. So size is really important. I set my dashboard around about 11, about 1,100 uh, by 1,000 by 800, basically. So height is more important than width because I'm trying to think of a page um, A4 size of a piece of paper um, and try to keep it inside a screen and to try and use to try and keep all the information in line of sight when they're scrolling. Because I don't want people having to scroll up and down to try and find information because that's not that principle about one page dashboards. So it's worth bearing in mind, and obviously, as you do your own, that should be something you think about in terms of what should be looking at in terms of orientation and size. So, in terms of build, this is where it gets exciting. So, we've had some thinking about what we're trying to achieve and some idea about how we might lay it out. So, in terms of build, we have the usual suspects. So five criminals, one lineup, no coincidence. Um, so when we look at dashboards, we tend to have a series we go to straight away. So we have Excel, which is the one on the left hand side. So this is my um, dashboard and page I built in Excel. Um, and that's pretty, it looks nice, nice consistent color format. Um, yes, it is that small of a text because when you try to squeeze all the information in Excel, you are down to font size six and below but it does a job but there's no interactivity i can't i can get some of the points interactive but it's not the same interactivity we'd normally expect to see um so i then bought tableau and tableau is superb um i love tableau um i think it's probably a fantastic drawing tool um but as we'll talk about pros and cons later um Let's see if I don't know if I can just jump over to, I've got this open actually. See. So hopefully you can see that. So this is my Tableau dashboard. Um, it allows you to do fun things. Oh, you see, look at that. There we go. As per usual, refresh, refresh, refresh. Um, always a problem um, when you're trying to present something is you get straight away stuck with a refresh. We'll come back to that if it ever decides to come back. That's the danger of using Tableau public is that it does take time, oh, it's bad. Um, you can do fun things like roll over graph in, that's not gonna show anything, oh yeah, it is. So you can do graphs, images in tooltips, which you can't do in Tableau. And obviously you've got all the functionality of tooltips and things like that. And it all looks whizzy and colorful. Um, so that's Tableau. And also we have the ability to do things in Power BI, so NHS Digital have done them in Power BI. Um, there's a link in the PowerPoint presentation allows you look at it, but um, it shows a danger of going horizontal strength because what you do end up with is one charts going off into the distance. And again, there's lots of um, scrolls because you try to do every single chart and page because there's lots of interactivity on this. So um, there's an interest digital one. But the reason you might be saying, Richard, this an is digital power by BI tool. Why are you building one in R? Apart from the fact Power BI is not open source, is this tool is a cross-sectional it doesn't go, it doesn't show you what the data was like last month. And one of the big things we want to know is have I improved or have I got worse in the data in a dashboard? So this tells you about the dashboard today, sorry, indicator today, but doesn't give you an opportunity to see how your coding has improved or not. So that's the sort of 
usual suspects are mentioning. So in terms of pros and cons, I won't go into every single one, but you all know the pros and cons to a large degree. You know, Excel's brilliant. It's a fantastic scrapbooking for ideas. You can do something really quick in Excel. You can do it really quick, but once. Um, and it's really easy to try and make complicated graphs by painting by numbers, by eliminating cells and things. And you can, put, you can do some wizzy things. And it's getting better all the time. Um, however, we all know that different versions of different graphing options. So if you're running off Office 365, the latest update like I do, when you go and show something in a trust, which may not be running that, you lose that graph. So you can't do a forest plot in off Windows uh, so Excel 2016, but you can do an Office 365. So you lose graphing options. Does, you don't have tooltips in the same way you do in Tableau. It's easy to corrupt because anything you just change a number on it. There's no version control. Um, and it's difficult to mass produce because you can't just create a whole load of PDFs off of it. But there's loads of other things. And obviously the um, situation with the coding, the COVID um, situation about the numbers of rows and things is an example of why Excel is not a great idea for these sorts of tools. Um, Tableau and other visualization packages which do exist, like Power BI or Click View or um, Yellow Thin or whatever you have, tend to have glorious graphics. Tableau more than others because Tableau, and I love this quote about Tableau, Tableau structures are plotting marks in space for near, nearly, nearly endless customization. Every pixel in that dashboard I control. I know exactly what I'm putting in it and I can move everything around. If I want to put a chart at 101 pixels to left and 97 pixels down, it can do that. No worries and it'll be fixed in place. Um, so it's desktop publishing quality, it's drag and drop technology, you just put things where you want it. Um, it's got automation now with things like um, prep and the link between Power BI and Azure and things like that. So all of those things are all there. And it's digital first, mobile ready, which is important with all the different uses. You have the iPads and phones you want to be sharing it with people, data with. However, the additional costs. You need a server or viewer licenses. You need new skills, even though it's point and click. There's whole things get head around in terms of language. Um, it's not print friendly. There's no way you can print that um, Tableau tool in a print friendly fashion because it's all about color. It's digital first, digital pretty much only. You do need to think about how you do print friendly. Um, and I can't transfer the, I can't write a function in Tableau and give you it for a, a presentation I've used. If I've used a certain um, format of a graph, I've got to write and show, describe how you do it. You can't just borrow my function and put your data into it. And you can't expand it. It's fixed in terms of what you can do with it. So in terms of R, well, we'll come back to that later because that would be giving away the game in terms of what I feel dashboard, how R is useful for dashboards. So but why if I've got my lovely Tableau, did I want to move to R? Well, the fact is, if I want to share a Tableau dashboard with a trust, either I've got to send them a file, they've got to have a viewer, and I have to invest in software. And it would still be dependent on me delivering it. They couldn't do it themselves. So I wanted to replicate my Tableau dashboard in R so I could give it to a trust and they could update it, personalize it, do what I like with it. Um, why did I choose Flex dashboard? Well, be nice, we all work in our studio. I've been doing Markdown and it said, oh, you can do Flex, Flex dashboard. So I thought, well, let's give it a go. There was no assessment about why Flex rather than um, rather than shiny or another way of going. So I just thought, well, I'll give it a go, see what happens. Um, this has been my journey about how to learn how to use Markdown. So just a quick introduction to uh, Flash Flex Dashboard. It's really easy to find. You just go into a new R Markdown document. It's from a template and you just click Flex Dashboard and of course that will come a Flex Dashboard template for you in a, mark, in a .rmd file. Um, it allows you to do interactive data, uh, JavaScript data visualizations using HTML widgets. HTML widgets, will you by end of this, you realize that HTML widgets are the bane of my life just now. Um, but I'll talk about why they are and that, why that problem exists later. Um, and it's probably because of the complexity I'm trying to do with the tool rather than Flex Dashboard itself. You can use our graphical output, so lots of ggplots and things. You can use tablet data, so um, cable and cable extra as I use. Um, you can do um, 
optional field coding source and paging and things like that. Um, value boxes, I'll show you a value box in operation in the dashboard, but you can use gauges. I haven't done any gauges on mine because I'm not really very keen on gauges, but you can do gauges and allows you to do text annotations of various kinds. So lots of flexibility. And if you could do markdown, you can do in Flex dashboard is pretty much what I was describing it. Um, it just puts it, it puts it into a grid. So all it's doing is applying a grid structure to a markdown document. Um, so that sounds like it should be pretty easy, doesn't it? Um, in terms of the build, I've created a workflow which um, I use to build my dashboard. So every month I download the zip archive. I know I could probably scrape it, but writing the script to scrape it is probably takes as long as it would to save and download. It doesn't save much time. Um, that goes into a new um, R, 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 RDS file um, attached to the bottom of my historical data. So I can maintain a historical data RDS format and I add that to the bottom every month. Um, I was producing a CSV file for Tableau, but I've expired that, but I've left it in there because um, the same file which produces the RDS file produces a CSV file, which I can then use in the Tableau public and also in Tableau tools if you want to. Um, but the RDS file then passes into the Flex dashboard and I've got various other um, things, I, um, resources I bring into Flex dashboard and then to produce the HTML file at the end. Um, it is a very modular construction and I've used the approach by Emily Reader um, to build the tool and it works really well. It's worth looking at her um, blog about how she does it. But this is the directory structure I use, so I have analysis, scripts, output, data, documentation and external files. And these feed into various bits of my um, modular um, markdown. So in my markdown, you'll see I've got a YAML. Um, and you'll see in the next few slides, of course, how I've rendered this. I've got my yet another market language header, YAML, my library, my source functions that are bringing in the data, a huge chunk of data wrangling. Um, and then it gets into visualization, text visualization, tables, other visas and fixed text. So there's a fixed text document, which I'll show you later, which is one of the options I have in the tool. If you're looking at the tool just now, it's in the manual page is the fixed text. Um, so that's the metadata. And I think that sort of structure really helps. And it's the sort of thing we do naturally, but actually structuring it in a way that you know where all your resources are really helps with the, re um, the referencing of folder structure within the tool. So you can use your dot dot slashes and things to reference to the, the data. So um, I am using a hierarchical sort of data structure. So the YAML. Now, this is always the interesting bit. YAML is really powerful in terms of setting the context of how you build the tool. Um, one of the concerns you have to be watchful is YAML has a very, very precise data structure. The odd space can really throw it out. So just be careful as you move between copying over options. Every page in this, every all the slides I've shown you now will have these like numbers on the side, which refer to parts of the um, R script. So you'll see one here, the title, R prams, um, Shin Explorer is the title. The R prams um, dollar trust takes it from this parameter, so it's RAJ. So it just says RAJ Shin Explorer. If you look at the tool, that's the top left hand corner. Um, then you set your output, obviously, with the Inflex dashboard. This could have been um, Zaragan or uh, Markdown, depending on what you're doing. You may have already come across themes. So we'll also talk about themes in ggpop. This is almost like a theme for the whole tool. It's a, CS, it's a CSS type structure. Um, I'm using Cosmo because it looks very much like the NHS house style. But you can change your look of your dashboard by just changing that one word. And if you go to Bootswatch, there's loads of different versions like Cyborg and various other ones you can use, which can give you a personalization to your style. Um, it'd be good actually that we actually set up something within the R community. I think we talked about it before about CSS for the NHS house style, which we could all use, which would save us all having to sort of bastardize things. Um, orientation, we'll talk about orientation in a minute, but usually there's two orientations, commas, columns or rows. You can embed columns in rows and rows in columns. It's very versatile in that sort of approach, um, but you have to set it at the top in terms of orientation you're going to use, but you will change it later anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, your vertical layout. Now, vertical layout is interesting because it affects how your size of your 
dashboard fills your screen. Now, I'm using a fill, so my page, there's no white space, there's no actually gray space around the tool. It all fills up with white space every time. But you could use scroll, and that would allow you to use scroll to go up and down to expand the spreadsheet, but a uh, spread dashboard. But I didn't want to remember, I'm trying to do a dashboard on a page, I've not used scroll. I would recommend with all these things is play around with them, see what suits yourself. There's no rule that says you should use fill for this or scroll for that. It's whatever visualization you like. Your parameters, um, so this is useful when you look to automate production. So this one I'm using just, I set a trust as ROJ. When you do a parameter, you don't need to worry about this, it will just overwrite it. Now I've got another parameter called include tech app equals true. So that means I include the manual. If I set that to false, the manual gets dropped off. Um, it just means if you use this dashboard all the time, you might not want to include the help guide. Um, it's a choice. This editor options markdown wrap 72 is a new part of RAML, uh, YAML, which refers to the new visual markdown editor. It doesn't really matter in Flex, it doesn't really do anything in Flex dashboard, but if you start using, if you've got some fixed text you want to use the visual editor for, that will then appear. So it's not really that important, but it doesn't do any damage to your dashboard, so don't worry about it. Just leave it as it where it is. So that's a YAML. So in terms of libraries, I've cleaned this up for this talk because I'm a bit of a magpie when it comes to libraries. I collect loads of them. Oh, new package, I can use that. Um, but also reflect some of those things I talked about before about how I code. So I do include SQLDF because I like a bit of SQL. Sometimes it just makes sense to use SQL. Um, sometimes it just helps me understand. But I've got uh, scales for doing setting scales, library date dates, obviously plotting for interactive charts, Funnel plot R because I use funnel plots, as I say, SQFDR, knit of tables, cable extra for improving table format. It's a really powerful tool, really helpful. And this is one we're going to get onto later. Did did points you giraffes? GGRAF, that's my thing. I'm going to that's a take home thing today. The thing to do this afternoon is get into GGRAFs. Uh, read Excel because I do actually have some Excel files I know. Um, should be CS, it should be a CVS file, a CSV file, but it, but sometimes it's just easier to do Excel um, and Calplot for chart arrangements, but you'll see that later. I have two data files, data shimmy and data diagnostics. Um, this is because combined the data set is 488 megabytes, so I can't load this up to GitHub as a very quick, easy up thing because it's a massive file. Um, and because it's so big, I use RDS for all my data stores, and that's why it's in the workflow, why I don't go, why I do split this into data entry and visualization is because it's too big but also that means that i don't have to load the data every time into the visualization um, every time i want to tweak something so it's faster to restore and also it keeps those attributes the same so your date to dates and numbers and numbers and things like that so that's why i'm doing rds in terms of that big chunk which i'm not going to talk about today because it's like 1800 lines of code um it probably could be shortened i know um, but this is about fixing the vagaries in the data set because not all variables go across all years. There's missing data. Some days you'll get a trust has no deaths for elective mortality, so therefore they drop out. So I need to fix that and put in uh, numbers for where that occurs because otherwise my charts will fall over, uh, especially with parameterization and production. Um, reducing content by excluding small numbers in charts. So some of the charts have shrunk down to, to where the small numbers affect. Making variable names user friendly, and I'll talk about that later. But also a lot of pivoting between long and wide, depending on what sort of visualization I'm trying to achieve. Um, and also for creating variables for in-text style. A lot of in-text style in this. You'll see in a minute there's loads of dynamic um, text, which is actually really important for giving saves time in the long run, but it's a bit of a, a bit of a tranche. So you can see invalid code text. That's me creating valid variables for my in-text style. Um, yes, and I know I should have probably set all these echo false warning forces in a, a knitter at the top, but I haven't done that. It's just one of those things I keep going, it's working, let's not break it, but I keep needing to go back and change and make it cleaner. Um, as I say, it's, it's a work in progress, it never stops, and you'll see a slide about that later. So, actually looking at the dashboard now, um, I thought I'd better just start with what a flex dashboard layout looks like. So it's pretty simple in many respects. As I say, it's like markdown with grid. 
So a row is marked like that. You have row and a level one header, no, level two header, sorry. Um, a chart is marked by three hashes and you create a tab set by just doing uh, curly brackets dot tab set. Dot tab set fade just means it does this like fade effect, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. So basically you can see that row, row, two rows, one, two, one, two, and you have three charts, one, two, three, one, two, three, and the tab set is set up as basically create a tab, so there's a break in that row, and therefore you get tab one and tab two. It's pretty straightforward. You add a new page by adding a level one markdown header. So in this case, I could do like hash ribbons, and you can change your orientation by doing curly brackets, data orientation equals columns. So that's basically your flex dashboard. Everything else is then how it looks and the visualizations you put inside it. So if you've got the dashboard up, hopefully you do, you can see in page one, the summary. So this is the opening page. This is basically that cut and paste straight into your board report. This is, uh, on, so the cut and paste section here. You'll see there's one, two, three. Those relate to the next page when I describe how these are actually encoded. So there's three sections to this, a title bar, a text section and a table section. Um, so that's basically what I'm trying to do here is just give the person who's reading this the headline of what's happening, how it compares to England, and this text goes through and, as I say, just describes the data in detail. And then in terms of how that's designed, this is the wire view for it. So you've got a title bar and two a text page of 600 pixels, a table of 400 pixels. And that's written this way. So summary, data orientation tables one, this is the page. We're doing it in columns. So the first, I've got two columns, one, two, and I've got shimmy is my title for this one, which was in the previous one, which was shimmy, and then you'll come to, which is set up as tables. And in this version, that just has some dynamic text to show the latest um, uh, publication text. So hopefully you can see that in the report. So one, two, three, that's the layout used to produce that page. The most of the R in this is actually building this dynamic text. Now, this is one of the sections. So this is for basically saying what is the shimmy. And this sense, this all this R, with all these arrows, creates this title that says headline. Um, headline font in HTML one. So shimmy, the shimmy for the Princess Alexandra Hospital, trust short name, for the period publication text to latest publication. So from publication to latest publication is rounded, dum dum dum. And it's an if statement. So if the trust value is free, that's an outlier status, is as expected. Oh, no, it's not that's so, uh yeah. Um, if it's greater than three, it would be higher than worse than um, and you can just see how that sort of works but you just have to start keep writing it but you can do formatting and stuff so I set the format for that period start date which is a date to be um, set as month and year so you can see June 2019 so a lot of what goes on in the visualization of the dashboard is actually formatting um, numbers and dates and text to make it legible so this is a very readable sentence for a executive because it says, well, wait a minute, what was my data? So it is as expected, but it is higher than the previous period when it was 10.059. Admittedly, the difference between these two numbers isn't very significant. However, uh, there's a bit of a challenge around what would you do to define the change? And that's one of the things I'm looking at as we go forward is actually constantly re reworking this dynamic text. So page two. So on the title bar, if you click on to overview, you get this page. So this is the meeting that you're probably wondering when you look at the other one, where's the dashboard? So this is the dashboard, really, the big dashboard, and it follows the F-shaped design. So at the top, the most important information is this value box. It's blue, it means there's nothing to look at here, it's, it's as expected. If it was above expected, it would go orange. And that's pretty straight, it's easy to code in, um, Flex dashboard, it's one of the built in uh, widgets. But it does take up a lot of space because there's a lot of space over here on the right hand side we're not using. So again, there's three sections here A, B, 
and C. And that looks converts into this. This is the wireframe, so title navigation, the value box A, the headline chart line B, and then the tab set C. Now we start to get a lot more blue over here, so we've got more R over here. So this is how it renders in the how we actually write that. So A is this section here. So that's the value box. I've missed out there. I've got that slightly wrong. So the value box is there. So it just goes, it's one row, two rows, three rows. So I should just move that down, sorry. Um, yeah, so row one is the value box. The summary is already there because that's the title navigation already exists on every page because of the summary um, propagates over every single page. Um, then you have, as I say, the value box, which is this row. Then you have the shimmy. So I've set up another row. So hash hash row because I want another row. And then I've set, so hash hash three is shimmy. So that's my title. Um, and it's got a date height of four. So the section I'm actually putting in, so this is my output component. I've set it to be 400 because I want it to be 400 pixels high. I'm trying to control the presentation by using pixels. Um, and then I do a bit of R just to create a chart. And then I create another output component in my row. So in my row, I've just got one item, two items in my row. So rows go left to right um, in terms of content, uh, whereas columns would go vertically. So then I've got my other component, so hash, hash, hash for my next component. I've stuck in a, this square box allows you to do a reference, so reference between two pages. So if I clicked on that, I would then be move on to another page. And sometimes the results equals as is. So this is a deploy results as presented can be useful. Um, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it is. Um, again, it's a bit of a vagary. I'm sure there's a good science behind it, but I do a lot of PDSA cycles to find out what works and what doesn't work. I have set these graphs now, these charts in the tab set to be no mobile. So if you want to do a mobile version, you can have a mobile chart and a no mobile chart. And or just if you don't put no mobile, it presents in mobile anyway. So you can have a mobile specific version which only presents on mobile devices or a no mobile presentation which doesn't present on mobile devices. So all these charts here do not present on mobile devices because it does not work. Um, one of the user feedback said they wanted a tab on the tabs. You've got them in the previous um, wireframe. It showed basically a tab just as a text. You can put a badge, which is like a blue pill around them. And basically, one of the user feedbacks was they couldn't see the tabs. So I've put this blue badge uh, badge on everything. And it's blue because the badge is set to primary, which is a primary color off the theme Cosmo. So if you wanted to change that color, you can just go into Cosmo and change up to badge dash red dash pink, whatever color you like. So it's very flexible in that respect. But badge primary just means make it the primary color Cosmo. On page three, so we're now moving to conditions over time, which you could have got to by doing the hyperlink, we have this dot chart. Now, this is the one which it loves, but doesn't quite work because the colors should be more differential. So the color should go from a deep yellow to a dark deep blue. But basically here, we're trying to show the change in the excess depths, which is um, a measure which comes out of the shimmy um, coloured by, so the excess depth should be the size of the dot and the colour is the depth of the shimmy. Now you could use this for say a &E performance and it could be percentage of a &E, could be the colour, so getting redder as it got worse, but the actual dot could have been the number of breaches or the number of um, attendances and that would be scaled to the size. So the idea was just to try and show how things move in and out of um, significance. Now, on the tool, let me just see if I can actually get to it. Yeah, so I've got my version of the tool here. So in conditions over time, I'll just show you how Plotty works. So this is a Plotty chart, and you can scroll over and you can see all the um, tooltip. Um, and if you capture a bit like that by using the crosshairs, you can then see in more detail. Um, you'll see it goes up to November because 
I've actually expanded the limits here to make sure this is a perfect circle. Otherwise, um, R would have done this to it and demi-circled it um, because it cuts off a hard limit. So that gives you the option to just jump in. It's one of the advantages of um, plotting for difficult charts, big charts like this. And you just go to scale it back again. So I could have gone down the bottom. And again, I can see how set to scene has improved to be less depths. So that's how you use auto scale. Hopefully by now you've also found lots of problems with the um, old trust dashboard, which changes in size, which I'm going to come back to later. So that change over chart, change over time page is very simple in terms of the look and feel of coding it in Flex dashboard. It's a page, conditions over time, orientation equals rows, probably good in columns because it's only one chart. I've set up my row. So again, there's my conditions over time um, title. My row is there and my chart is this hash hash hash. Um, and I've got some text in there just to describe it. Um, and what you can do with Plotty is the default is Plotty gives you loads of options, including the logo for Plotty. Um, and some of these things are too interactive, like photograph, find. Um, too, too, there's too much complexity there for the user. So you can just take them out by actually just doing mode buttons to remove, which is pretty straight, you know, pretty much it says what it does in the tin. And then you list all the ones you want to take out. So I've taken out lasso, 2D, select 2D. Um, so I've just left in the ones I want to leave in. Um, and of course, so you could build in more interactivity if, you're, if your chart demands it, but I actually find this just auto scale and works well because you're only asking the user to do one bit of interactivity. So chart four is a ribbons chart. Now this is something, again, it's not a plotted chart because ggplot will not allow you to set the X limits for a stacked bar chart to be not zero. So it's a bit of a problem um, with ggplot because these, I should just go back to it. So on these ribbons, um, you'll see that it goes from um, about 2.6 to 7.8. Now you can't do that in ggplot because ggplot wants to fill this space in here with additional black gray space. So these are all set up in Plotty and they just basically allow you to see the spread um, across a variable. And you can see whereby there is quite a wide variation in some options. So for this one, to, to render this page, um, I've used columns because I've got variable um, numbers. So I've got two, I've got my coding indicators here. So I've got two pairs of coding, so depth of coding, elective, non-elective, coding invalid signs and symptoms. Then I've got my place of depth indicators and my crude rate of depth. So I've got 10 ribbons. So I've used columns because it allows me to be more flexible. I couldn't use rows because I'd have had a bit of a problem with one row where it's gone right away across. A uh, bit of interactive text, inline text, just to show um, just to give a description um, and again just to make it every time pertinent. So just use the date period. And then what I've got is my three columns, one, two, three. So column, hash, hash, get some new column. So I set my data height to be 800, so to be 800, um, which doesn't quite work because then I've got, this is demonstrates why data heights may not actually work when you're rendering because I've set my data height to be 150 for every single chart. However, they're not the same height. So what you think might happen doesn't happen. So here I've set my data height to be specifically 150 pixels. So they all should have been the same height. And I show you a gap at the bottom of these two, but it doesn't work that way. So that may be because I'm using fill rather than scroll. And again, it's just looking at that and understanding it for your own dashboard. So again, it's about you have to look at these things and think, will that work? Will it won't work? Um, in this case, those I might as well take those out. However, it does make a difference for mobile. So leaving these in means that mobile will all be the same size. So maybe it works for mobile and it won't work for here. Again, it's trial and error with most of this. So help manual is the last page. 
and it mirrors the layout of page two because it gives you the help guide to page two. So you have the same five sections. Um, it would be nice if we could link the key elements, but we can only link the pages because it would be nice to say have a help button in the shimmy, which is go to help and then you could have read the help guide. Because um, again, it would have done that point principle about giving people directions about how to read things. So in the tool, in manual, you can't jump from here. That shimmy doesn't take you to the overview. So what would be nice, as I say, is if you've got this like link conditions over time, jumps to conditions over time, an overview jumps to overview, I can't jump from that page to help. Um, that might not make a big difference for shimmy, but if I'm looking at my relative changes page and I wanted to help here, I couldn't jump to the relative section here, um, which would be activity. Um, I couldn't jump to that point. So you can't jump to in page like you could do in HTML. So a bit of a limit there. Um, again, it mirrors um, the normal layout, but this time I'm using actually a child file to do this. So I can actually eliminate this whole section from the dashboard by setting the params to be false. So if I set my evaluation params, if I set my include tech app to be false, this won't appear in the dashboard, it just will vanish. Um, because if it's false, it won't bring in this technical appendix.rmd. And that's what technical appendix rmd looks like. So you can take the whole chunk out and represent it differently. Um, it's probably not so important in the dashboard, but it is helpful when you're modularizing between a markdown and a flex dashboard approach to a tool. So charting. So I'm going to just quickly ooh, running out of time, so quickly run through charting plotting. So basically, charting options, different options. Plotty is an interactive package. You can make ggplots be interactive. The big difference here is that when you do Plotty, you can reset the um, tooltip to be really good, whereas the tooltip in plot, ggplot is really bad because it just looks like that. and It doesn't look as nice, perhaps. Also, oh, that shouldn't be there. Um, multiple charts, subplot, facet, wrap or grid. Basically, the big red across is because it's because basically by the time you get to this point, you realize that plotty and ggplot and well, ggplotty is not the way to go forward with um, charting in the flex dashboard. What you want to do is giraffe. Giraffe is a really simple package to go interactive. Um, it allows you to do on on to tool tips, it allows you to do on click actions, and it retains all the aesthetics of ggplot, which Plotty doesn't, and ggplot doesn't. So you, to turn a ggplot into ggraph, it was as easy as add underscore interactive to your geo. So over here, I changed a geo line to be interactive by just sticking underscore interactive on it, and setting my tooltip to be tooltip. And tooltip is a column in my data set. I set my data ID. What do I want to use to drive my tooltip to be four? So my four in this case is my grouping option in my GT plot. And that's all you do. And you've got interactive graph. Brilliant. Um, you use all your normal GT plotty stuff. You can use facet wraps, which work brilliantly. But what I have done is changed my values up here. So I had things like short name for indicator to be called to be four. I changed my growth value to be percentage increase. My period end to be 12 months two. So a lot more English. And I've created a tool that says four. Um, so four is basically my um, indicator I'm using. So that will change for every single one because there's a whole list of them factored here. Um, my growth label. So what is so oh yeah, so four is the trust, or I should say. Four is the actual trust or region. Um, the growth label is what I'm looking to report. My 12 months is formatted to be month year. So you can see that in a page and overview. So on this one, you can see that I just get it up. The problem with this is you've got to be really targeted because it's really small target area. So it says four is mid Essex. Defs is the um, percentage growth and the 12 month period to March 2011. So you've got a really good tooltip. And you can see how when you do a geo, it actually, the interactive line actually goes and changes different color. So it looks really good, really busy. It's ideal. And um, that's a really good 
cool. It's, it's saved my life in terms of trying to do charts. So you'll notice that not all charts are done in this way. So to add in Markdown, all you do is you have, uh, this gets a bit more complicated because you have to do ggplot to HTML and you just have to do a bit of stuff here, but it's a little bit of a challenge, but it's where good stuff happens. So you use fill to set the color of your background to use tooltips, so blue to orange, and you use ops hover and ops hover in to do that select line. Um, one of the good ones is, in actual fact, if you look at the activity, you can actually do, you can set it to be, the data ID to be time, not, um, oh, I don't know, trust or whatever. And you can then see how an orange line goes across. We really good. Um, there is a problem. Markdown is sizing and it really struggles with sizing. Um, you've got the essential activity between tab width and tab height, the SVG size, so the image size of the HTML widget, and resizing. And there is no way around this, but because the creation of HTML widgets in tab set is very flaky. Um, flesh dashboards without tab sets is probably fine, but the HTML widgets in tab sets aren't rendered as well as you could be. And it's probably because of the way this box is set in terms of the tab set size in this box is unknown to tab set, so is unknown to HTML widgets, and therefore some of the sizing goes a bit awry. Um, you can see that with alternate views because this is a GG, this is a graph plot, a giraffe plot, sorry, and it's done, it's, it's filled the whole tab set. It's exactly the same setup as activity. Now that's a facet wrap one, and that's not a facet wrap one, but you can see the difference, and they're set up exactly the same. So I've got to work on how to make that work. So there's a lot of PDSA cycles required to do that, um, but when it works, fix it, keep it, and move on. Um, parameterization, you can do lots of parameterization. Big problem with parameterization is the more complex the dashboard, the more likely to throw errors that are not data related. You'll run a dashboard if you just try to do a series of dashboards, like one after each other iteratively by changing the parameter in the tool without doing it through a parameterizing, they'll all work. You'll run a whole series, a list of them through parameterization, through um, this sort of manufacturing process, production process, and it will fall over. And you won't be able to, it's, it's a challenge to decode why that's happening. So just be aware that this does work but it may throw up one of those errors, so don't do it on Friday afternoon for a panic last minute deadline because um, it will throw up problems or can throw up problems. Browsers, it all works on all the same browsers, so no issues there. Going mobile, Flex dashboard probably works brilliantly without tab sets and does work brilliantly without tab sets. However, it does not like tab sets. So this is um, some of the renders from various screen grabs on mobile devices and tables seem to work well, text seem to work well, even that huge complex conditions of a time chart works well, ribbons work well, the page of tab sets, no, didn't work at all. Um, tab is better in that regard because it's got pre-sized defined sizes. It actually tells you how big an i10 screen, uh, iPhone 10 or a Galaxy, whatever they are, phones are, and you can actually build your tool to render exactly correctly. Um, so, still not got it to work. Um, persevering, persevering, but it does, you know, it has that functionality which can be useful. Um, recycles, obviously, because it's modular design, it's easy to move between Markdown and Flex dashboard, so I can use the same charts, the same um, uh, wrangling. I just need a couple of chunks between the two, and I've got a really nice uh, report which I can send out to people and say, here's your um, trust report and again it's interactive so with HTML um, there is breaks in here so it does print properly to PDF so it doesn't um, you can use a um, slash new page in um, RMD to actually print this to PDF so it all works well so in terms of pros and cons and I'm going to run out of time for questions sorry about that so pros obviously are free open source that are that's all brilliant and all that lots of things it does better like the funnel plots were a lot easier to do the first time around um, and I can do the whole workflow in one go. And I do like the idea of getting my two products for the price of one, because that means I've got less work to do. Um, however, you do need to use neural skills. I had not expected to have to remember all that HTML. Um, lots of HTML to learn. 
um, to remember how to make it work perfectly. Biggest problem is not pixel perfect. All that sizing, it's like really frustrating when you go from Tableau when you're specifically laying it exactly, when you can't do that in R is something you just have to get over um, and work with your customer to understand. Um, and it is an idiosyncratic way, ways that the packages respond differently to changes. So, as I say, with some of that viewing, it does go a bit weird sometimes. Um, and the issues with HTML widgets is a really crucial to function of tab sets, which you just need to get it to work for you in a way, but just think it is going to be problematical. And I'm happy to work with people, anyone, if you've got any ideas, it's quite a, um, I'd love to know how to do it. Um, it's not completely free, because of course, if you want your own server, then it's going to cost you a bit of money. So, what have I learned? It's ideal for quick dynamic dashboards, and if you've already got an R markdown report, which is really nice, then it's easy to convert to text dashboard and vice versa. And it is much more rewarding than sending a slide back. And it's obviously the right way to go for um, digital first. But is it a viable corporate dashboard tool? Oh, it's a good question, because the build process is too complex. There's too many PDSA cycles um, for you maybe to justify to your manager that why are you spending ages doing tweaking an SVG size from between three and four to try and make it fit? Um, but once it works and it's fixed, you're probably doing OK. You do need skill sets which are beyond potentially the normal skill set for you quite often as usual suspects because you do need to have a good, you do need a grasp of HTML to make benefits of CSS files um, and things like that. If you've got an understanding of HTML, it does help with Flex dashboard um, because you will be able to get a much more benefit about using HTML in things to set different um, styles and things like using italics to highlight um, variable text. So, by the end, would I recommend it? I think I would recommend it. You just it's not as polished, so you just need to get it as good as you can and be happy with it. Otherwise, it will become a demigorgon, and it will absorb all your time trying to make that. Oh, I could just get it right, um, because it can consume more time to try and get that functionality and, and visualization perfect, and you know, rebuilding for better tools as they come along. So I wish I knew about GGGraph six months ago because I would have not had to go back and rebuild all my tools. But that's that's just the challenge of, of that. Um, so it is a bit of a, can become a bit of a demagogue. In terms of some people say, how long does it take to build? I think you can get 80% of the dashboard very quickly. In probably a week and a half, you can build a really good dashboard. Like you could have probably get that dashboard quite well built in you know, a week, two weeks. However, to perfect it will take you an ongoing, it never stops, it just keeps going on. And as we know, season four of Stranger Things has just been commissioned because it keeps going on and on and on. So it's a bit like that in many respects. It just will drag you in if you do not set a goal specifically. So make sure you get that definition of, of the audience expectation really high at the beginning. And so where next, just quickly, um, I'm not necessarily going to do it to Shiny because I don't need that functionality. I am going to look at making it in GGGraph because that will help reduce complexity and probably adding a bit more um, in text because I think it will make it better for users to understand what's going on. And that's looking at trends in many respects. How do I describe the trends? But it probably is going to my endless pursuit of pixel perfection. And my last slide was basically just a bit of inspiration about the things which actually did make me, you know, were helpful. So obviously, how Zoo's work on KP on Cable Extra, Rachel's work on the, I'm um, sorry, Emily's work on modern visualization, and Tom's work on. I mean, that's a fantastic presentation. If you use mostly of that, that works really well. But some things don't work. So that's probably taken up miles too long. Um, so I don't know if there's any quick questions or anything. Uh, thank you a lot, Richard. It was very, very brilliant. Um, and it actually, yeah, it actually attracted quite a few questions. Um, so if you have time, stay you go on to after this, I'll yeah, if you have time, it would be brilliant. Um, so first one was, uh, is it possible to create different versions of one R dashboard that adapts its layout according to the language chosen? So 
does that in terms of language chosen is I suppose the question is what does that mean by language chosen? So are we talking about it would be because through the parameterization um, you can obviously set just go back to uh, because in dashboard production you can obviously use the parameters to set if you've built different ones then you can probably just create different functions here and then you know change it but um to then build your own tools because the parameterization is really just straightforward if you just keep changing whatever functions you want but i don't quite sure because um I do, as I say, it's all modularized. So as long as the data is the same, you just change the um, the end visualization, the markdown side of things. Because in, in actual fact, the markdown visualization bit is really the last bit of all the work. Um, the real work is done in the data wrangling to make sure the charts are correct. So I don't know if I answered that question very effectively. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I read it as well. Uh, but obviously, if uh, Mayanna, who asked questions, still here, uh, you can um, reply and let us know whether we actually answered the right question. Uh, the next one, I think you covered a little bit at the end. Uh, it was about if we have already invested in Tableau, Tableau or Power BI, uh, why would we chose to use R instead? Uh, I'm not sure if you want to have just one punchline yeah. uh, on the top of yeah. what you already said. Well, one punchline on it. The, the the one difference is between using, I mean, obviously, I think it's the investment in the staff rather than the tool. Is if your staff are already chain, trained in Tableau and are complete Tableau workers. I mean, on the Tableau conference, um, Jaguar Land Rover was describing their data process, and everybody uses Tableau. Everyone from the person putting the screw light bulbs into the headlights to the chief executive uses Tableau. So you wouldn't go and change over to R. However, if you're not maximizing the potential of Tableau, and also you've done a lot of data heavy load to get it into Tableau, then actually the R stuff is really good. And I think the advantage of R is that you've got the ability to modularize it really quickly into different tool sets. So that once you've done a graph you really like, you can use it in everything. Whereas in Tableau, you have to almost copy the dashboard, change the workflow, hope it works. Um, I think personally, and it will depends on also how you do it. I think it probably is the interaction between the data warehouse and your visualization is probably the key. I found Tableau prep and loading data into Tableau was causing me grief in terms of the size of the files. Whereas the R1, I can do, I can make my data flow much more effectively than I could in Tableau. However, I do love the glorious graphics in Tableau, but it's, um, but also it depends on the finances of the cost of actually maintaining Tableau um, because it's not cheap. Um, you get you could easily get half an analyst for the price of Tableau and that could be your person who knows R better. And also you've got the whole R community, which I obviously promote because it, um, it does help solve the problems. Um, and also I think the problem is, yeah, is working with other colleagues across the piece is probably a challenge. And I think probably the bigger challenge is there's a wider policy debate about nationally, which way do we go? Because the challenge between Power BI, ClickView, Tableau is going to be a challenge of ICS integration as well. I mean, you know, new reforms is going to probably push that and therefore What's the lowest common denominator across the system? And that is going to be something like um, Azure or R in many respects. And I think that's where the debate is. It's probably not at the visualization end, it's probably in the um, ICS integration about how you have the lowest common denominator across those new teams, about how they share resources, which is probably my answer to that is what's your ICS going to do? And should you not be thinking about that. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, very good point. I'm really glad to hear that uh, we mentioned that just our community as a uh, kind of friendly community to help you. And yes, I'm not aware of NHS uh, T or NHS Tableau community. Uh, so yeah, but it can be somewhere out there. Um, anyway, next one uh, was from John. Uh, John asked, uh, does your current RFlex dashboard effectively have this SHMI performance for any trust as you're using NHS digital extracts? So Currently, this is the published data set and I have it for every trust in the country, so I can do this for every trust in the country and that's why I use my uh, production line form. So these are using the public dashboards, data sets. I have a dashboard which isn't as well developed as this one or the extract data based on the extract data format, but that's difficult. As I say, it's like one can't take it outside of a trust because the shimming extract data, the record level stuff is locked into the data secure side element of it, but um, that is really a powerful data set because you can do so much more with that. Um, that's why I always, I always encourage trust to download the shipping extract. It's free, it's brilliant. Don't, you know, I'd almost don't buy another product from Dr. Foster's or HED until you've downloaded the shipping extract because until you sweat it out asset, you don't need Dr. Foster's or HM, HED because um, you can do so much more of that. But yeah, this is done for every trust in the country. Um, I have just chosen Mid Essex because that's the one I'm working with just now, and hence why I know it so well, and I know where the errors are in the data set. Yes, uh, brilliant, thank you. Uh, and I think we have two more questions. Um, so, question from Alison On the page showing conditions over time, um, is it possible to filter for conditions? Uh, I think on uh, Alison's screen, it, all, it was all squashed yep. together. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yes. I, I, Currently not. This is filtered for the most concerning conditions, shall we say. They are to have more than one death or something. Um, that's, again, that would probably be where one of the um, interactivity I would think it would be useful here would be actually to say, could you just put filter for a measure? And that would be potentially useful. I did wonder about doing something with crosstalk so that you could maybe do something on this table here, like see an R code on here, and that would then flag up on here or just select it. Um, that's something I was thinking about, was looking at as crosstalk and seeing if it could do that. Currently, there's no uh, um, filtering on this um, because it's really, I'm trying to, trying to highlight the fact that changes happen which aren't necessarily significant. So the overview here, highlights the significant values, um, but often there'll be changes in areas like um, here, which wouldn't ever flag on the dashboard, but may actually be important to track. So why did they get excess deaths in blue track? Um, so it's one of those ones whereby I've given a bit of flexibility in terms of the freedom to explore. But yeah, you, I think you're right. That's one of the things I never thought of in actual fact, so I'm going to take that away and think about should I put a, a try and see if I can do a filter on this page? But that might need to be sure when you see that. I know think Flex Dashboard does allow a bit of um, um, filtering, so I'll explore that. So that's a really good question. Uh, yes, so thank you, Alison. Uh, I'm glad to, uh, it's uh, not just a question, but something uh, Richard, which might inspire you to uh, do next steps. And I'm glad you also mentioned crosstalk because our last question is from Julia. Uh, and Julia asked, uh, does GGGraph work with crosstalk? Um, I don't I don't know, but I've got no reason. If, if, GG, if GGplot does it, GGGraph will. And there is some examples on the DigiGraph website about how they do that link. And in many respects, the one of the things you can do is a bit like the activity one where you've got this going across time and you can see exactly each one, which is sort of cross talky, but it'd be nice to have the numbers highlighted in each one. Um, you can actually do things whereby you could click on a dot and it would dot would appear in every single one of these charts. So I've not explored that because I was still playing around with um, getting these charts right for this talk, uh, <laughs> proving a little bit irksome the other day. Um, but yes, it should have the same functionality as crosstalk, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work because as I say, GG graph is pretty much GG plot with um, all the functionality. 
it's really i mean i, I love it i think it's fantastic what they've done because especially because if you go and see some of the resources and it's basically just there yeah, just to hashing you know dash interactive or underscore interactive after the word and you can do anything um it'll tell you if it's not been rendered um so it will still work it just it, it'll just come up with a warning notice if it doesn't if it's not been um added Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, there are also a few questions around whether this is being recorded or whether uh, we will be able to share materials and then says yes. So uh, this webinar will be on our YouTube page uh, on the NHSR community channel. And also uh, we will um, check with Richard whether we can uh, share a link to GitHub or whether we can just upload it to our website. So we'll find a way to uh, make sure the uh, presentation is available as well. Uh, so thank you, Richard, a lot. Uh, I know how busy you are. Uh, so thank you for attending, uh, for helping and for sharing your knowledge as well as staying even for a bit longer to answer the questions. Uh, and thank you for everyone who attended uh, and for everyone who stayed uh, with us till the end. Again, even though we um, overrun a little bit, uh, I'm just going to share quickly again link to a feedback form. If you could uh, uh, fill it, we would be very, very grateful. But um, overall, keep in touch with our community. Uh, please join us on Slack. Uh, make sure you following our Twitter and also um, make sure you uh, are attending our future webinars. Our March one will be non-technical and it will focus on uh, how to communicate uh, uh, analysis, results for analysis, and uh, just overall analysis with uh, non-analysts. Uh, non um, so I will uh, see you all in uh, March. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.